I'm going to take you uh, to, first of all, Romans 16, verse number 3 in your Bible. Romans 16, verse number 3. We're going to look at about three portions of Scripture, and then I'm going to take off <laughs> and bring the message uh, entitled, Sitting on the Right Side of the Field. In Romans 16 and verse 3, we find uh, the Scripture says there, the Apostle Paul greeting the Roman saints. In other words, those who were born again in the Lord Jesus in Rome. He said, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul, even though he was a great leader and was a, a missionary and was a chief uh, apostle and all that kind of thing, he called these people fellow workers. He didn't think of them as servants of him or anything like that, but fellow workers. And it's great to see that, that he had that type of an attitude. Over in verse 4 then, let's follow it. It says, uh, speaking of Priscilla and Aquila, he said, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. In other words, all these people give thanks also for Priscilla and Aquila. Those are beautiful names, Priscilla and Aquila. Now go with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians, uh, going to the epistles of Paul uh, further. This is a church epistle here in Philippians. The church in Philippi, one of the great churches of the New Testament was in Philippi. One of the most wonderful missionary churches. Gave money to missions, faith promise, uh, things of that nature. They loved missionaries and uh, they were a loving church. And the, the main theme of uh, Philippians is joy. They were happy in the Lord Jesus. In Philippians 2, verse number 25, Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. Notice again, he uses the word fellow, equal. They were brothers and sisters in Christ to the apostle. Uh, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all. Now, Paul must have been from the south. You notice he said, you all? <laughs> and uh, then he said, and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on, the, on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more er eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I be, may be less sorrowful. And then he said, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. Think highly of him. Hold him in great regard in esteem because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. The Apostle Paul was so grateful for this man and he held him up in high esteem. Uh, to the people, to the people of God. And he said, receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness. And then we go over to Colossians chapter 4, just another, uh, a little bit further to your right. <laughs> Colossians 4, verses 7 through 9. Another person that Paul speaks highly of here, a fellow worker, a fellow saint, fellow believer in the Lord. And he says here in chapter 4, verse 7, Tychicus, a beloved brother, fellow, or faithful, I should say, faithful minister and fellow, there it is again, servant, and the Lord will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. And then in verse 9, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, he was one of those in Colossae, that church. They will make known to you, Tychicus and Onesimus, will make known to you all things which are happening here. Now, they didn't have the U.S. Postal Service, which, by the way, is in a lot of trouble right now financially, but they didn't have that way of sending the mail, I don't believe. So he sent these men, and they carried his epistle to these churches. It was personal uh, delivery, you might say. Uh, taking the, the message from the Apostle Paul. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we ask now that the blessed Holy Spirit would quiet our hearts and minds and help us, Lord, to focus upon the Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, to learn of you. 
And I pray if there's one without a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, may they be brought to you today. And God, help us who are thy children to be encouraged and to be challenged. May we not be willing to accept second best. Lord, may we desire to do our very best for you. Forgive us of where we have failed you. Meet our needs today and we give you thanks for it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, amen. amen. Now, uh, of course, you've been to the ball field. We're talking about sitting on the right side of the field. This is especially in football. You know, when Redondo played, the uh, opposition would sit on the opposite side when going to uh, Dare Lisa's games there. And then the home team would sit on one side and the opposition on the other side, across the field. Uh, and uh, I was reading about one fellow. He went to a ball game and he got in the wrong group. And he said he couldn't believe the terrible things that they were saying and how hateful they were of his team. He said he was so uncomfortable that he finally got up and moved over to the other side to be among his friends, among those who were on the same side he was. Now, we've, many of us have been to places where there was uh, similar things happened. Uh, years ago, we went to the All-Star High School game in the Rose Bowl and one of those with us was the Jim Zorn, who was a quarterback for Seattle. His sister was a member of the church in Belfire, where we were at the time. And she and her husband went with us. And we were sitting there at that game. And uh, somebody came along, and there's a few rows in front of us, and, and told that man, said that, that he wanted to sit there or something. I don't know what he said. But it was no time until wham, bang, they would start hitting each other and falling over the benches. And, well, we got out of there. We didn't want to be anywhere near. <laughs> Violence breaking out all over the place. Uh, John went to a game one time years ago when Oakland was uh, the Los Angeles Raiders at that time. And of course, if you didn't know it, I want to headline news, John is a Denver Bronco fan. And he went down there to see the Broncos and the Raiders play. And he was sitting among some of these folks that were really, you know, they were Raiders, all for Raiders. And boy, they, they about took him on. <laughs> You have to be careful when you go to a ball game nowadays, isn't that right? I mean, you might get in the wrong crowd. And here recently, of course, the one man was beaten almost to death at a Dodgers game in the early part of the year, and I think he's still in a coma, still horribly in a terrible state of a coma, and probably uh, for the rest of his life will be in, a, in terrible shape. And, and we, uh, we see at some of the other ball games, there have been some people shot out in the parking lot uh, this year. Uh, and uh, then just recently, uh, there was a taser used at, uh, I think it was, uh, it's, I don't know why the Raiders got in there again, but I think it was the Raiders and another team. Uh, you remember who the other team was? San, the 49ers. Somebody's a fan. <laughs> 40, <laughs> that's your team. Okay. But uh, somebody got tasered in that game. So, I mean, you never know what's going to happen at these athletic events. Uh, and some people, I think, go to the game not because they love the game or not because they love the team, but just to be a part of the environment and they get that beer flowing. And pretty soon they act crazy and start doing wild and woolly things. <laughs> and uh, so you have to be careful. But uh, we need to sit on the right side of the field. Now, applying this to uh, the work of the Lord, it doesn't take long for the carnal and the worldly professing believers to get together. That's right. A lot of times they attract each other because they have some things in common that are fleshly and of the old world. And sometimes it doesn't take long for the old, the cold and unconcerned Christians that really don't love the Lord with all their heart. Sometimes they kind of migrate together. But the same thing is true, though, of the committed kind, those who are really committed to the Lord. And sad to say, the complaining Christians, they always find each other. Have you ever noticed that? Somebody's unhappy about something in the church. Don't like the color of socks the preacher wore Sunday. Pretty soon several people get together and start complaining about things. They always find each other for some reason. I've seen that over the years. That happened many times. But I'm thankful that those who are really sold out to the Lord, we call them around Redondo Hills the core, C-O-R-E. They're the core of the church. They're the heart of the church. And you'll find most of them on Wednesday night. When we have our Bible study and prayer, you'll find many of those folks at the core of the church. And you'll find them on Sunday night when we begin a one is in a generation for Jesus tonight. And you'll find them at places like that because they just love the Lord and they can't get enough of it. They just want to be there every time the doors are open. They don't want to miss out on anything. And so that's great. And I want to be on the right side of the field. How about you? I want to make sure... The devil knows which side I'm on. I want to make sure my neighbors know which side I'm on. I want to make sure everybody knows which side I'm on. I'm going to be on the right side 
of the field. Now notice some things in your notes. If you'd take these notes and uh, just fill in the blanks. Uh, first of all, I want to be identified with God. Amen. I want to make sure I'm identified with God. I want to be identified with His truth. Thy word is truth, the Bible says. And it says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. That's John 14, verse number 6. And then I also want to be identified with compassion. God's people need to be a compassionate people. We need to love people. We're in the people business, if you want to call it that. This is God's business. This is God's ministry, God's work. And I want to be a part of identified with compassion, praying for the lost, having compassion for the lost, for the homeless, for those who are down and out, those who are ha without a job, those that are going through a divorce, those who are having, uh, who've had uh, ex been experienced by a death, a loss of a loved one and death, whatever it is, we need to have compassion and I want to be identified with that. Jesus said, in, or it tells us about Jesus in Matthew 9, 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. He had compassion. He was moved with compassion. He had a tender heart. And how we need to be moved to compassion to do what God has called us to do. Our missionaries are people who have compassion on the mission field. And this is our mission field. This is where God has placed us and how we need to have compassion. We also want to be identified with God in the area of eternal life. That's the message of Redondo Hills, to preach that God is life. In uh, John chapter 6, verses 68 and 69, the Bible says in verse 68, Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Yes, we have the words of eternal life. I was reading about Mark Twain one time, and this story told about, he said that he'd received an invitation to visit the king of a great country, Samuel Clemens, who was known as Mark Twain. And his daughter exclaimed to Mark Twain, she said, if it keeps going like this, there won't be anyone for you to get acquainted with. But God, <laughs> isn't that tragic? Uh, that statement, we can lift it out of there and, and just say that about a lot of people today. How tragic it would be to know the president of the United States or the governor of the state or the mayor of the city of Los Angeles or some great celebrity, someone who has a lot of money. How tragic it would be to know them but not know God, the one that we must know in order to have eternal life. He is the answer to our questions to our problems he's the answer to our lives now secondly not only do I want to be identified with God but the second point in your outline I want to be identified with God's people the church I'm a I've been a member of a church now ever since I got baptized about I think I was around eight years old somewhere in that area uh, our little church in Akron Colorado didn't have a baptistry yet we were a new church so we borrowed or used the church over at First Baptist of Brush, Colorado. And one thing I remember, when I got baptized, Brother Ray Anderson, the pastor, put me down in the water, and he didn't realize there was a pipe right there, and he hit my head on that pipe. That's why I'm this way, Ron. <laughs> You've always wondered. <laughs> and he brought me up out of that water, and it was an act of faith for me to get baptized because I almost drowned a few years before that, and I'm scared of water. <laughs> I, had, I finally learned to swim a little bit, but not a whole lot. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, baptism is how we're identified publicly with Christ and with the church, and I've been a member of the church ever since then. Got saved at church, got baptized at church, yielded to the ministry at church, got married at church. I mean, I just lived my life around the church ever since. Ever since I was a little tyke, that's what I've known. And I wouldn't trade it for anything, folks. I want to be identified with God's people. Everything, of, every great thing that's ever happened to me has been at church. Oh, there's been some disappointments. There have been some problems. Been some terrible things happened. 
But God was with us and we worked through it. Family, church is a family. And you go through things together. And in spite of all the weaknesses of God's people and my own weaknesses, I want to be identified with the church, with God's people. There was an old man one time, you had a, he, everywhere he went, he had a can of that WD-40. You know what I'm talking about? And any time, he always had a can of that with him. And every time he'd hear a squeaky hinge somewhere, he'd take that thing out and put a little WD-40 on that squeaky hinge. <laughs> well, that's kind of the way we ought to be. We ought to get, have the oil of uh, human, uh, you know, kindness with us all the time. Every time the opportunity comes, spray a little bit of that human kindness on there. Let God use us, work through us all the time. And over in Philippians 2 and verse 5, the apostle said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ was humble. He was humble. He was strong. And uh, he was a man who loved his father and was obedient to his father. As God's people, as we are part of the Church of Redondo Hills, and we have a class 101 for those who are interested in knowing how to become a member of this church, you go through that class, and then we give you an opportunity to fill out the membership application and sign it, saying that you'll abide by all of those things and you'll be faithful and so on to a church covenant. And then that, uh, and once you've met those requirements, you've been saved and baptized, added to the church, then uh, you're part of us. You're a member of the church family. And I want to be identified with the church. And once you are, we find out as a church that we have the same direction. We're going to heaven. Those of us who know the Lord Jesus as Savior, we're on that same direction to heaven. Our battles are about the same. Our battles are the flesh. It's easier to do bad things than good things. Have you ever noticed that? It's easier. If you go the path of least resistance, you'll be doing bad things because the old flesh will raise its old ugly head up. The world, that's another battle we have. We're not to love the world. We're to love Christ, you see. And then the devil. He's our enemy, our arch enemy. Our battles are about the same thing. Our resources are the same too as God's people. We have the Bible right here, God's holy word. We have prayer. That's a common resource that we have as God's people to pray. And then the Holy Spirit. Those of us who know the Lord is Savior, our body has become the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's the teacher of the, of the word of God. He's our comforter. He's our, the one who empowers us. And our aim should be the same. Our aim, we are to glorify God. We are to worship God, glorify Him in all things. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. All the days of the week. Glorify God. And it says in John 17, verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. That was in the Lord's prayer, Jesus' prayer, as He prayed to the Father in the garden. We want to glorify God. He said, I have glorified thee on the earth. We need to glorify God. Please Him. Bring glory to His name. So I want to be identified with God's people. I'm identified with you. God's people. And then I want to be identified with the dedicated, committed crowd. That's the ones that I was talking about a while ago. Those who have really become strong in the Lord, we want to be identified with them. And uh, as a pastor for almost, well, Long time. <laughs> it's a long time. Let me, that's enough to know about it. Long time. Thank God for it. To be around folks that we've seen grow, seen saved, grow in the Lord. And some called to preach. Some to the mission field. We've seen lives changed and it's been such a rewarding experience. And the Bible tells us who are God's people in 2 Corinthians 6, 17. A lot of people leave this out, but let's look at it. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. This is a missing note in preaching and teaching nowadays. People say, well, you can be saved. Just do whatever you want to do. Just do you're free and so on. Well, that's a certain tr tr uh, point. That's true. That's right. But we all have to answer to God. You see, the policeman of the church is not me or some person. It's the Holy Spirit. He's the one that convicts. He's the one that tells us whether we're doing something right or wrong through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 6, verse 17 of 2 Corinthians, it says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. You see, back long before the Surgeon General 
put the, the little uh, thing on cigarette packs saying it's not good for you and all that. Uh, I, I was preaching that it's, tobacco's not good for you. <laughs> I was preaching that you shouldn't do it. shouldn't take those things that are not healthy for you, that are bad for the body and so on. We, and uh, other preachers, they were preaching the same thing. And we, we were thought we were, we were crazy. You know, they, they'd say, man, look at those crazy Christian preaching against, now it's the end thing, not smoke. You know, that's the end thing. It's the politically correct thing to the point they've even taken freedoms away from people in the guise of that. I mean, personal freedoms. A lot of our freedoms have been infringed uh, in the country. So, but the Bible says we're to come out and be separate. Abraham was called by God first. He said, come away. He called him out of a country to lead the children of Israel be the father of the nation of Israel. You see, it's a teaching of the entire Bible. And I don't look at it just as separation. I look at it, first of all, as consecration. I'm to put the Lord first in my life. I'm to give Him my all first. And if I do that, the other part's going to take care of itself. Once I really give my life to the Lord and realize He's a holy God, the other things will take care of themselves. Some people say, well, I don't think I want to receive Christ because it might change my life. I won't be able to do what I want to do. Yes, you can do what you want to do. He'll just change your want to. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Trust Him. Put Him first. He'll take care of those things. The Bible does not teach isolation. Jesus ate with the publicans, didn't He? Matter of fact, the Pharisees, those do-gooders, they were the ones that gave the Lord the most trouble. We're not taught isolation in the Bible. We're to go to those that need the Lord. Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. He sends us into the mission field. Yes, I need to identify my life with people who please God. And that's what we do, like on Wednesday night I'm saying. The, the, the uh, separated crowd or the dedicated, the committed crowd. One of the men in the Bible that comes to my mind, first of all, when I think about really pleasing God, really doing what God wants you to do, the man that comes to my mind first is Enoch. I don't know about you, who comes to your mind first, but Enoch comes to my mind in Genesis 5. And Elijah, that's right. But Enoch, it says, walked with God. What? And Abraham walked with God. He was called a friend of God because he walked with God. But Enoch walked with God. And uh, Enoch, one time, he was walking with the Lord. He got a little way too, this kind of way I imagine it. He got too far away from his home. And he said, Lord, I need to go home. It's getting dark. <laughs> and the Lord told him, said, man, I'm enjoying this so much, Enoch. I, I, I just want some more time with you. So Enoch said, all right, Lord. Walked a little further. Finally, the Lord said, hey, Enoch, why don't you just come on up here? You're closer here than you are back to your home anyway. And the Bible says he was not, for God took him. Yeah. Enoch's one of those men who died in the Bible, who didn't ever, he never died. I mean, God just took him. Amen. They couldn't find his body I mean, because the Lord just took him on home. Wouldn't that be a great experience to walk with God like that? D.L. Moody was a man who really walked with God and who really wanted the power of God. And he prayed and prayed and said, Lord, fill me. And he said, I want to, I want to see a man who's completely 100% dedicated to you. He said, I've never known a man like that. And he, he gave his all to the Lord. And one time when he was in Chicago, he was so overcome by the power of God, he had to go up to a friend's hotel room and he said, Lord, please take some of this back. I cannot handle it. And when he died, he said, I still haven't seen a man what, can do, what God can do through a person that's totally 100% committed to the Lord. Even though he'd seen thousands and thousands, maybe even millions of people come to Christ through his ministry in his great crusades. Oh, how we need to learn the secret to just walk with God. Don't worry about pleasing man. Let's just be concerned about pleasing God. Because that's what it all amounts to. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I want to identify my life with people who please God. I need encouragement, so I want to be around people who encourage. I don't want to be around people who are going to pull me down and discourage me. I want to be around people who are going to encourage me and lift me up. It's great to be around people like that. That's one reason I love Brother Clayton so much. 
He, I consider him as my pastor down there in Houston, Pastor Brother Clayton. I've been here, here a couple times, revival meetings. But he always encourages me. When I'm with him, I just feel so good. It, it's just great to be with him. And if he tells a joke, I love laughing at his jokes. <laughs> They're funny, but I just love being with him. And that's, I like being around people like that. How about you? It's encouraging and lift you up. And then I want to be identified with those who are used by God. The Apostle Paul said there in 2 Timothy 2, speaking to Timothy, his preacher boy, this young man, he said, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not many or only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel. You see, that's, we're a vessel, you and I are vessels. And he said, if you purge yourself from these, you'll be a vessel unto honor, sanctified or set apart, and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. You see, God doesn't have to use just anybody. We must meet his criteria. We must live the life that he tells us to live so he can use us to the full extent. Then I want to be identified with those who will hear him say, well done. Romans 14, 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I want to be on the right side of the field, folks. <laughs> I want to be with that crowd. And then, fourthly, I want to be identified also and always with the serving believers. I want to be identified with the serving believers. How about you, with the serving believers, those who are willing to serve God with all their heart and mind and soul. In the Gospel of Luke 9, 62, And Jesus said unto him, He was giving tests of discipleship. He said, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He didn't say he won't go to the kingdom of God, but he's not fit, you see. And how, how when we begin a work for the Lord, we need to be faithful to it. God will bless you if you'll just be faithful to what he has called you to do. You see, God is calling people to follow Him. Don't fall by the wayside. Be faithful. Many offer excuses, all kinds of excuses, why they're not doing what God wants them to do. You know, I could have quit, and I wanted to quit many times, but I found out I just can't quit, so I don't worry about wanting to quit anymore because I know I can't quit. <laughs> Years ago, I thought by wanting to quit, that meant life was kind of like uh, the pains right before you know it happened. But I found out I can't quit, so it doesn't bother me anymore. I just, if I want to quit. <laughs> Does that make any sense to you? You see, the Lord's the one that's put me in this, and he's the one that's going to keep me in it. Wilfred Funk, who wrote an uh, article, a column, he titled it, uh, It Pays to Increase Your Word Power, was the name of that column that he wrote years, a few years ago. And he said that the 10 most beautiful words in the English language, and he mentioned these 10 words, chimes, dawn, D-A-W-N, golden, hush, lullaby, luminous, melody, mist, murmuring, not murmur, but murmuring, tranquil. I didn't find the word work there, did you? <laughs> I thought, sure, the word work would be in there, the ten most beautiful words. <laughs> no, it's not beautiful to most people. Work, I mean, that's a negative thought. But it's a necessary word, isn't it? We need to work for the cause of the Lord Jesus. So I want to be obedient. I want to be obedient seeking others. Someone observed when they read about the, the uh, Samaritan, Good Samaritan. Remember, some of you may remember that story how that the Samaritan ministered to the needs of the unfortunate victim of the robbery, but the Levi, the uh, pr uh, priest and rabbi went by and they just went on by the other side. They wouldn't help him. I guess they must have been taking a survey and the, and the Samaritan went right to help him. Sometimes we use, you know, surveys are good in the rightful place, but sometimes we use surveys as a way to keep from doing what God wants us to do. We just study the matter and study it and study it and study it and we don't do anything. One preacher, this was down in Texas, by the way, Fort Worth, he said, the people, he said, let's do something around here. He was getting kind of, you know, discouraged if people wouldn't do it. He said, let's do something around here. Even if it's wrong, let's do something. <laughs> Sometimes we find out that it's wrong by doing it, you know, to try it, test it, and see. It's worth a try. 
J.S. Kendall wrote these words, There are many things which God does in which we have not part. God paints the clouds of golden harvest. He keeps the stars in orbit. He sends showers and sunshine. He paints the roses and lily and scents them with their sweetness. God does those things, doesn't he? I, I don't even help him with it. I just appreciate him. And then he went ahead and further and wrote this, But there are other things which are just as great and beautiful in which he permits us to be co-workers. He gives us the opportunity through service to put the tents of immortal beauty on human souls. Oh, how we need to minister to others. I want to be identified with God, with His people, with the dedicated, committed crowd and the serving Christians, believers in the Lord Jesus. I want to be identified with them. How about you? I want to be identified with them. It matters little where I was born or if my parents were rich or poor, whether they shrank from the cold world scorn or walked in the pride of wealth secure, but whether I live a surrendered man and yield my whole life to my master's touch, I tell you, my brother, as plain as I can, it matters much. As I said earlier, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It will be worth it all. Every heartache, every trial, every victory, all of these things, it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. God help us to sit on the right side of the field. Let's look to the Lord in prayer.